Welcome to the Startup Grind. Thank you. Thank you. Nice introduction. <laughs> All right. So, in true Startup Grind fashion, we actually like to start by getting to know a little bit about the person behind the business. So we're going to start with your early life. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what your family was like, what kind of culture or, or community you grew up in. Uh, so growing up, my dad moved around a lot. Uh, he's a pretty dynamic guy. If any of you have ever met him, he has far more energy than I do and he's in his <laughs> late 70s. Uh, so he was either getting fired because he offended someone, uh, <laughs> starting a new business or getting hired away to go somewhere else. Uh, and I actually think I was just talking with one of the guys I work with that uh, that actually made me, I really learned to love change growing up. Sure. Where, uh, you know, you got a chance to reinvent yourself. There were a couple times, like, uh, I remember living in Boston, and I was kind of struggling, you know, socially at the school there. And when we moved to California, I remember <laughs> my mom grabbed me. She's like, all right, you know, you can Problem reinvent solved. yourself. Who do you want to be? You got a fresh start. You can kind of rebrand who you are. Yeah. And um, I true. actually think that's been kind of helpful uh, as I've gone into entrepreneurship, seeing my dad fail, fail, fail. And then he hit a good one in Silicon Valley. And that was pretty cool to be you know, a part of that. And uh, then I saw him company? fail a couple more times. Uh, he went out and basically was hired in as a CEO of a really small software company called CAE Systems, Computer Aided Engineering Systems. Mm -hmm. They're one of the early 3D CAD companies. Cool. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a huge hit by like, today's standards, but uh, you know, it was material enough that that's actually where the, the funding came from that allowed us to start Taser you know, 10 years later. Very cool. Good, good. So what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were young? I originally wanted to be a fireman. Okay. <laughs> it was for the hat. For the hat. <laughs> fireman hats were just... just sure. Bad. And what did your first few jobs turn out to be? Uh, well, this is the only real job I've ever had. Um, oh. I did. Straight out of college, right? Yeah, straight out of... Uh, well, I went from college to business school mm -hmm. um, because I went to undergrad at Harvard, and they don't actually teach you anything that's like a real job skill there. <laughs> You can study like Greek poetry or archaeology. <laughs> uh, and so they literally didn't have business classes. And uh, so I said, well, you know, I should probably get some. I, I knew I wanted to do something entrepreneurial um, and I wasn't sure what it was. Uh, so uh, but I knew that once I like got out in the world, the chance of me like going back to school was really low. Right. So, uh, yeah, so I went uh, straight into B school and then came out. And while I was in business school living in Europe, had a couple of friends who were shot and killed here locally and became very interested in whole topic of gun control and violence oh. and just given my background I looked at it as a problem where huh you know maybe there's an opportunity to solve this which is actually one of the things I like to sort of talk to people in general about that like if there's something that gets you upset or angry about the world like one thing you could do is go work for a nonprofit on it like you could go join the Brady uh, you know gun control group for example mm -hmm. um, Although I think in even more effective ways, if you can turn it into a business problem and solve it that way, then as you solve it, you can bring more resources and scale right. uh, and, and perhaps have an even bigger impact as an entrepreneur than you could as somebody that's doing nonprofit work. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think your, your early studies were in biology and then it was international finance and then you started Taser. Yeah, well, so, the international finance was because I wanted to spend a year in Europe. Just oh, okay, to be totally okay. honest there. And, <laughs> Got it. Uh, so, Parlez-vous français as uh, a result? Un, un petit peu. Okay, okay. Well, I lived in, in Belgium. Belgium, though, in the Dutch part of Belgium, though. And, okay. Uh, the Dutch and the French there sort of have a little bit of a rivalry going on. And so as an American, I tried to learn French in Dutch Belgium. <laughs> and then people would look at you like, are you trying to insult me? Like, oh, no. I know you're, you know, you're not, you're an American. Why aren't you learning Dutch? You're in Dutch. Belgium. Right, right. I gave up. And so you just, gave up. Okay, I gotcha. So, so yeah. And then tell us kind of the, the founding story of Taser because you, you came across someone that had some technology and you built a business around it, right? Yeah. So, um, so I was living in Europe and I had a couple friends that were shot and killed. Uh, and being outside of the States, looking back, it's even maybe just a different perspective because most Europeans, you know, when they heard that story, it was like shocking to them. These things don't happen there. Gotcha. And uh, around the same time, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal that that year there had been 37,000 gun deaths in the U.S. Now, I'm not against guns, you know, frankly, politically, I'm sort of totally agnostic. Uh, but as I thought about it, I was like, you know, there's got to be a better way than blowing holes in people. I mean, we fought the British like 200 years ago with the same technology. And every other industry has changed dramatically, but self-defense, you know, the guns are smaller and, you know, 
maybe better than they were then, but uh, my undergraduate degree was in biology, so I was in neurobiology in particular. So I was always very interested in the human machine interface. I uh, wrote my uh, entrance, sort of the essay on my college entrance application that I wanted to work on uh, robotic limbs, uh, you know, Bionic Man, Star Wars, right? Like bionic limbs okay. would be cool. Uh, uh, and then as this started to happen, uh, and I, be, you know, then my mom around the same time said she was going to go buy a gun. So I have like these three interesting things happening that got me really interested in the whole uh, gun debate. Uh, and as I was reading up on it, and I started like, you know, in a business school class working on an entrepreneurship project. I, I wanted to do something around self-defense. And in my research, I came across this thing called the taser, which for me was very interesting because it was immediately obvious to me that an electrical weapon would be affecting your nervous system. So it sort of, it, it fit into my area of, of yeah. technical interest. Okay. Uh, and it turned out the inventor lived in Tucson, Arizona, uh, according to his patents. And so I just 411'd him. You know, we didn't have Google back then. So uh, <laughs> uh, I just called up, got his number. And next thing I know, I'm sitting in his living room in Tucson. And oh, he was wow. 73 years old, former NASA scientist. At one point, he was uh, the chief scientist on the prime contractor on the Apollo moon landing program. So wow. like super interesting guy. Yeah. Had, he had tried to do this taser thing several times previously, unsuccessfully, uh, and we sort of convinced ourselves to give it another shot. He was 73, I was 23, he's at the end of his career, I'm at the beginning of mine, you know, he's looking what he's going to do with his life's work, I'm looking what I'm going to do with my life, and so it was like, just fit like a hand in a glove. Yeah. Uh, took me a little while to convince him, though, because he was, he had a short time horizon. He, he basically wanted to raise money to, to take the money out and go do something. Gotcha. And uh, so it took me a while to convince him that, you know, I couldn't make that happen because this was going to be friends and family. Uh, right. and, and we had enough to, like, invest and give it a shot, but that the payday would have to come later. Right. So, so what were those first few years like? I mean, were you guys, what was your, like, market strategy? How did you approach trying to take this technology and turn it into a product and get it out there? Uh, so our original business plan was to go after the consumer market. So the original taser devices back to the 1970s uh, had this problem where they used gunpowder to launch the darts. Well, when you launch something with gunpowder, it's a gun. It's a firearm under law. And the original taser looked like a flashlight. It turns out it's illegal to make a gun that looks like a flashlight. <laughs> that's so, probably a good thing. So when I talked to Jack, like, that's why their business failed. You know, making a product that's illegal is generally not good business. <laughs> There's some places it works. Um, <laughs> But that sort of shut them down. And so when I met Jack, his original business thesis was, hey, let's, uh, l let's get rid of the gunpowder. We'll use compressed air, and that will make it not a firearm. And we can go after the big market, which is consumer. Turns out, like, if you look at gun sales, police and military together buy about 2% of the guns sold every year in the U.S. 98% are bought by citizens. And that's where my heart and soul was, too. Those are the people that we want to impact. Out of the 37,000 people shot and killed in the U.S. every year, a couple hundred are killed by cops. So, the, you know, so it's the place we can have the most good. It's the biggest market opportunity, and it's the one they couldn't sell to previously. Uh, so we spent our first year. Uh, well, first thing we did is we, we basically approached the problem as uh, sort of risk mitigation. Namely, what's the biggest risk that would kill this business that we have to overcome? Well, number one, our product's got to be legal. So, okay, how do we make sure that it will be legal? So dealing with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, we discovered they would not approve anything from a sketch. They had to see a functioning prototype. Okay, well, that then focused us. The f job number one is we got to build a functioning prototype. So I moved to Tucson, and uh, my parents had a little motor home, so we took it down. A big I, sacrifice, really. Yeah, par <laughs> parked in a little trailer park, and I uh, lived there for three months, and we worked out of Jack's garage and, uh, you know, focused on building the first prototype. So, huh. you know, actually, when a lot of people ask me about, like, the key to getting started, uh, what I'll relate to them, it's just getting started. It's like literally planting the flag and saying, I am doing this. Because that's where I think most people stop. Because everybody has great ideas. It's true. Uh, and if you wait until you think you've got a, good, a great business plan, like if you, if you wait till you've got it all figured out, you'll never start because nobody's got it figured out. Uh, my original business plan was totally different. I'd actually had a different business plan for doing something totally different than I met Jack. And Jack already had the taser, and he had this technology, and he had this idea. So we threw business plan A in the trash, said, okay, let's go this direction. I'll license your patents, and we'll do this. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of sort of getting started and mm -hmm. 
you know, you get up in the morning, you say, okay, what can I do to move the ball down the field today? And you work on that problem. And then you just, you know, you sort of iterate on what's the next big problem. You just kind of keep cutting them down. Very good. Uh, so what kind of a leader do you think you were in those early days? I mean, initially, you and your brother were working together on it, and um, your dad was probably kind of advising or something. And when did you have to bring on staff, and how did you guys kind of work with that? Yeah, so the original fundraising, uh, we thought we were going to get to market on $100,000. Uh, we missed that uh, <laughs> target by uh, by quite a bit. Uh, so yeah, so my dad, uh, you know, drank the Kool-Aid and, and put up the initial funding. My brother uh, and I started the company together, and then he, he had a day job. Uh, I did not. I guess one of the other formative things I did was I just decided I'm not going to interview for a job uh, when I was finishing up at University of Chicago, um, which I think was really important because it was already a crazy idea. Uh, but it was easier to make the crazy decision when I didn't have a job offer on the other hand. So I, I sort of had this realization, if I went through recruiting and I had a job offer, now it would make it seem even crazier right. because now there's an alternative to this. So <laughs> I figured, I, I sort of set myself back and I said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just go try this. And if it fails, like I'll take, I'll go be a you know, ski bum for a couple months or I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go do something fun. I, I basically told myself, I've got one year that I'm gonna just pursue this. And if it fails, do something else. And then I'll come back through the university's recruiting next year and deal with it then, which was very sort of liberating to, yeah. to go and give this a shot. So my brother had a day job and he, uh, so he was doing like, frankly, a lot of the, the logistic stuff that you have to do and it's, it's, it's hard to figure out like taxes and payroll. <laughs> um, and we didn't really need employees until about three months in and that's when we built the first prototypes, got the first approval from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And then once we got the approval, we said, okay, well now we gotta figure out how we're actually gonna make these things. So mm -hmm. went out and hired, so an engineer that had a manufacturing background that could help us, you know, figure out how to take it now from a prototype to something we could build. Oh, very good. And so how, how fast forward maybe five years. So I guess this puts us, what, just a little before the year 2000? 98, 99. So what did the company look like at that point? Oh, that was super ugly, dark days. Like we were now five years into it. Like we were, we were failing. Uh, uh, it's right at the time actually I met my wife, so she she joined me right <laughs> in when things were like utterly <laughs> hopeless. Um, Good woman. And, and then turned things around. So uh, the um, we had the, we the consumer market had not taken off, and we just couldn't figure it out. Um, a lot of it, we, we basically came to a conclusion that consumers just didn't believe the technology was real, and that we had to get professional users like police to actually really start using the stuff. Um, and then while we were uh, while we were preparing to enter the police market, we did this crazy publicity stunt at the Consumer Electronics Show where we, we basically built a car security product that would shock you if you tried to take it off the steering wheel without the remote control. That was called an auto taser. Ton of fun from like a publicity standpoint, but nearly killed the company. Because we, uh, when we showed this at CES, like it was a, it was a, a publicity spe spectacle. I mean, our booth was packed like, 20 people deep the whole show because we had this this cool demo where you could come up and grab it and we had a contest to see who could hold it the longest when you're getting shocked you can imagine like it's like a rodeo i mean this is a spectacle of people trying to hold on they're getting shocked they're screaming and their friends are laughing and the tv crews are filming it and uh, we had a couple like pep boys had come by this huge automotive chain and they wanted to be a national launch partner and uh, one of the things that uh, the, the lessons i think we took from that is don't ever do anything to get rich don't ever do anything for money, because that's what sucked us in. You know, we weren't passionate about automotive security. We had done this thing just to, have, to sort of test the idea and have something fresh to talk about at the Consumer Electronics Show. And the publicity stunt just ran away with it, where all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, you know, Pep Boys has 4,000 stores, and if they sell one a week, you, know, you start running the numbers, and we're gonna be rich, so hey, damn the torpedoes, let's go do this thing. Well, it turns out that that thing never sold. There was no market really for the product, it was a great, if we could sell spectacle tickets to watch people do it, <laughs> you know, we, we were sort of like the bearded lady new at the circus. New business plan, we, we new business joke. model. Yeah. Uh, and so by 98, 98 was the year we realized that that had been a failing strategy. And by now we had spent, like basically my dad was, was tapped pretty well dry. His best friend who had also invested in the company was also like on the brink because they, luckily they were both with us in the booth at the Consumer Electronics Show when we made the fateful decision to pursue the auto taser, 
Uh, and then we woke up and we realized we're out of funds. The business has failed. And I actually recommended that we should shut the business down because uh, uh, you know, we didn't have, I, I didn't think we could make it. And my dad only at that point had about $500,000 left from the money he'd made in Silicon Valley. And I said, look, dad, you've got to, like, you've got to go into survival mode. And he pointed out, he said, well, yeah, son, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but I'm a guarantor on your line of credit at the bank. And we owed Silicon Valley Bank $1.75 million. So if you do the math, son, <laughs> my half of that is like 900 grand. So if the company fails, the bank's coming to take everything. They just haven't been paying attention that all the collateral has gone into the company. So I'm going to put the last 500 in. I'm going to get Bruce to match, who's the other investor. And you have $1 million to figure this out. But we're not, you know, failure is no option. And that million dollars barely squeaked us through. I mean, we had to cut two thirds of the company, fire, you know, most of the people that work there, go into, you know, starvation mode uh, and our strategy at that point. So we took about a week to figure out what was our next move. And it was really just getting back to basics. We need to create a non-lethal weapon that was really effective and works well. Uh, so we'd learned basically that there was another problem besides the gunpowder, the early tasers were unreliable and not very effective. Uh, so we took a million bucks and basically said, we're gonna go do the testing to really figure out how to dial up the effectiveness, productize it and launch it in the marketplace. And it was just basically doing what we said we were gonna do and getting focused on our core mission. And then once we did that, we launched a product called the M26 in the police market and it just went haywire. I mean, we launched in late 99, by the middle of 2000, we were cash flow positive. By the, Q, by the third quarter, by October of 2000, a year after launch, we had an investment bank uh, that came to us and signed a, a deal with us to take us public. Uh, six months after that, we had an IPO, and that was in 2001. <coughs> Between 2001 and 2004, sales were just tripling every year. And uh, 2004, we were the top performing stock in the world, which was Crazy. pretty cool. So yeah. we went from like, complete starvation, utter failure to yeah. like spectacular success by just focusing on solving a problem that mattered. I think sometimes you have to go through all those early stages where you are trying this and trying that to really finally give up and focus on that sweet spot. And that happens a lot, but that's awesome. It worked out really, really well for you. So then- Ultimately it did. So, uh, okay, so for you as a CEO now at that point, you've kind of made it through that storm and you're rebuilding your company and, and growing through that. Um, what kind of a leader were you kind of during that, during those years, the early 2000s? Uh, not a great one, uh, to be honest. I was a chronic micromanager. Uh, I, you know, when you're an entrepreneur early, you know, early on, you have to do everything. It's true. And you get used to doing everything. And uh, so the way I was hiring and running the company was sort of like, okay, I'm going to like solve all these interesting problems. I just need people to sort of do the tasks of, you know, <laughs> what it takes to run the business. Uh, and so through no fault of the people I hired or the way I was managing them, uh, and it took me till I'd say around 2007, that as the company was scaling and it just felt like the bigger it got, the harder it got, and uh, the more stressful it was. It was like, this is just not fun. And, you know, we went through a number of you know things where we put people through various like management training courses, and I remember one where I got some pretty scathing feedback. You know where they go to like all your peers and they give <laughs> feedback, and I was expecting it to be like, oh, Rick's like this awesome leader, and it came back and it's like the guy's a chronic micromanager, like it doesn't give people room to like you know do their jobs, and I was like right in the face. <laughs> um, so that coupled with uh, you know a couple other challenges we're facing in the business. For me, it was a big challenge to finally step back and say, you know. I need to focus on really actually hiring people that are better than me at anything, at every specific job in the business, uh, and then letting them run and resisting the urge to jump back in. And I, I like problem solving. I think you know, it's true of a lot of entrepreneurs. You, you, like, you get a thrill from getting in and doing the work. And uh, for me, one of the biggest challenges in transitioning to being effective in the CEO role is you have to like, literally get comfortable going all day and not feeling like you actually did anything. <laughs> like, I was, I was talking to one of the guys here earlier, like two years after we were public, I was still our, our webmaster. Like I was, ma <laughs> I was manually doing our website. I was writing our brochures, you know, and, yeah. but there's a certain reward that comes to that. You go home at the end of the day, it's like, okay, I, I know what I did today. I created something of value. Right. Uh, but as we got bigger, I realized like the company would grind to a halt 
because people were sending me emails that they needed like stuff cleared up. They needed answers to things that sometimes I wouldn't get to for a week because no, no, I'm working on some new stuff on the website. And uh, sort of having this realization that I had to, for about a year, had to go through a phase where I was intentionally sort of training myself when I came in the morning. Say, okay, my number one job today is to make sure I have made everybody else here as productive as possible. That nobody is, I'm not on the critical path on anything that's like that's held up. And only once everyone else is productive and I have cleared all the critical paths, then could I go back and work on things as an individual contributor, which meant I rarely ever got back to be an individual contributor. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. That's interesting. So um, I think you said around 2005, your company went through some, some crazy times too. Yeah, we've, uh, we've had a bit of a roller coaster uh, at Taser. So like in, in, on December 31st, 2004, our stock was up from the low point, it's like 5,000% or 4,000%, it was crazy. Uh, we were in the Wall Street Journal that year ranked us number one in the world. Uh, so we like to sort of joke around that at the end of December 2004, everybody wanted to be Taser. But by January 7th, 2005, a week later, nobody wanted to be Taser uh, because we got hit with an SEC investigation. So our stock was moving around a lot. And in the process of the stock moving around, you know, there's a lot of controversy around the taser devices too, right? We'd gone from sure. this little garage shop early on. So one thing to enjoy when you're, a, when you're a startup is you generally get pretty good press. Like nobody kicks the puppy when you're a startup for the most part, <laughs> unless you're doing something awful. So like when we were a startup, like all the press was like, oh, there's these two brothers and they're trying to make the world a safer place. But then you get a certain level of success. And now that's not an interesting story anymore. Now it's like, you know, is this, are these people evil? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. Are they really telling the truth? Or the, this company is successful and it's skyrocketing. So uh, I think one of the early indicators you're making it is when you start getting hit with a bunch of negative press. <laughs> um, and so the, the confluence of the nature of our devices being used by police, and you know sometimes you know, people get hurt or, or even die in police confrontations. Uh, and Anytime a taser was involved, all of a sudden, you know, it was huge controversy. Are the tasers killing people? And did the company lie about the safety of the devices? And the stock is running. And uh, so there were, you know, there's one point where we had a, a New York Times reporter whose like, mission was coming after us. And he wrote some really awful stuff alleging that we'd lied about the product safety, uh, which just still to this day inflames me. Uh, because he claims that we'd mischaracterized a safety study done by the Department of Defense. And he called them, and he knew the DOD had signed off on our press release. And he still spun the story that we lied about it. Um, anyway, that was front page of the New York Times. And right uh, around that time, insiders had sold stock. And so his story was Taser lied to pump up the stock price and the executive sold. You know, two months later, the SEC comes knocking. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey guys, we read about you in the New York Times. And we'd like to talk to you about this. Um, and the story leaked. Uh, so normally these investigations are supposed to be confidential, uh, but uh, and th I could go Not down so a real much. rat hole here. We uh, <laughs> uh, we actually had a mole in the company that, that was leaking oh. information out, and uh, so that ended up in this firestorm. So the stock by by January two thousand five, the stock was down fifty percent. Uh, and we got hit with a raft of lawsuits. So 2005, we went from you know being on top of the world to a fight for survival again. Um, so really, 2005 and six was just sort of saving the core business. Uh, but then ultimately, what came out of that is the new business that we're in today uh, that uh, we never would have done if it weren't for all the controversy around the taser weapons. So you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's true, and it's funny because every time you make it through one of those valleys and you're back up on a peak, you just you get so excited, but there sometimes is another valley around the corner, right? That's part of the entrepreneur journey is you take on those valleys and you turn them back into peaks. So, yeah, which, so I would say, you know, one piece to take from that is actually learn to savor those really dark days. Like when things can't get any worse, chances are they're going to get better. And be humble and afraid when things are going really well. <laughs> so like right now, things like Taser's kind of on a roll. The last year has been really great. And just given my experience, I'm kind of, holding on to things right now like all right yeah i know when it's dark that it's gonna get better but when things are really going well uh yeah <laughs> hard for it to go a lot better but it can always you know you can trip up again i get it i get it and so this time around you guys kind of approached innovation again but 
you approached it differently than you did the last time. So how did that work out? Well, we, uh, so early on, we were very sort of secretive about our product development. And especially once the taser started to take off, uh, you know, we were one product company. So, uh, and looking back on it, I think we had very good reasons uh, to not involve our customers in product design. When you're making a, you know, one product that's 100% of your revenue, sure. there's a big risk. Hey, if people here were working on something new and they hold off their orders, like that could materially degrade the business. Um, but around 2007 or eight, we had a couple, uh, our first two taser devices in law enforcement were mega hits. So with the M26, that we launched in 99, which I talked about. And the thing we did there is we just made it effective. We had to fix the effectiveness problem. And once we did, it sold like crazy. But it was kind of big and clunky. So the next one, we focused on making it smaller. And the X26 was that product. And we launched that. And it, that just really threw fire, uh, gas on the fire. Um, so our third product uh, basically was more internally driven. The first two were internal as well, but it were things we were hearing from customers. Uh, you know, the first one was like, hey, the thing doesn't work. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. And then once we did, hey, the thing's too big. So the third phase was, well, you know, this thing's really still a single shot weapon. For it really to be effective, we'd want to have a multi-shot device. And we developed a, a product called the X3. And uh, by now, we finally had the resources to go hire a bigger engineering team. Uh, and with that, came some real challenges though, because it's different when you're in scrappy startup mode. It's like we have one electrical engineer and one mechanical engineer, and you know, we're gonna put this product together. All of a sudden when you have a team of like 10 people, you have to do different things to manage them. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be honest, we fumbled. So our first big project, I was micromanaging it too much. It became like a science project for me where I was trying to cram too many features into it. And then we had a big team working on it that wasn't necessarily really, really well coordinated. Uh, and they were, sort of doing sometimes engineering for engineering's sake. So by the time we launched the product, it was huge, it was expensive. Customers, like, I remember when we showed it, frankly, it's still my favorite weapon we ever built. Things awesome. <laughs> but there's only one of me. There's a bunch of cops and they thought it was terrible because uh, it was too big to fit on their belts. Uh -huh. I was convinced that, hey, this product is gonna be so awesome, they'll make room for it. No, uh, they wouldn't. Uh, so that product bombed. Uh, and right around the same time, we also, was, when we got in the camera business, and our first camera also had bombed. We let the same symptoms, too complicated, uh, too much sort of engineering G wizardry going on, uh, too big, too expensive. Uh, so we had two bombs at the same time in 2007, eight. And uh, so that made us kind of take a step back and, you know, okay, I don't want to go through that again. Uh, and we really shifted the way we thought about product development to become very customer centric. Uh, which, you know, it takes a little more humility. You, you get a couple wins under your belt. And you're like, okay, I am the Steve Jobs of law enforcement. <laughs> I, I know what the next product needs to be. And I got you know, humbled pretty good after two big failures. And then I think we stepped back and said, okay, well, I'm not a cop. You know, I don't know what it's like to get in and out of a car 50 times a day wearing the stuff around your belt that, you know, the fact that our weapon interfered with the seat belt was the number one reason they didn't want to wear it because oh, just wow. like it would bump up against the seat belt and be very uncomfortable. So we then shifted our product development methodology to basically let's bring customers in and have them sit with engineers on every detail of the products we're building so that they can tell us what are the things that really matter. Things like tactile buttons so that on our cameras, for example, we have a button that like, you can really feel it so you don't have to look down at it if you're going into a situation. You can feel it and do what you need to do. Lots of nuance uh, that ever since we've implemented this newer product development strategy, which is not the black skunk works sort of approach, but very customer centric. Uh, every product we've launched has been successful hmm. uh, because we've just gotten very good now at, at listening to the customer's requirements and iterating uh, until we get the product that our market's gonna love That's rather cool. than the, me and the engineers are gonna be really proud of. Very cool. And, and then as you've kind of journeyed into these new innovative areas, you've also had to transition from being solely a hardware company to kind of part hardware and part software now, right? How yeah. does, I mean, that's a whole different line of business. What has that been like for you? Uh, don't do it. <laughs> if, any of you ever, if somebody tells you like transforming your business is hard, yeah, it's hard. And hard means firing people that you have like long relationships with and like fighting your own organization. Uh, 
it, it was sort of shocking to me. I, you know, having started this in a garage, you always think like, hey, we're nimble, we're a startup. Like this is, you know, no problem. Then try and take the company in a different direction. And oh my God, just the, we spent a couple of years just fighting ourselves internally. Um, now that we've done it, it feels really good, but it was super, super hard. Yeah. Uh, and just things like, you know, um, hiring software engineers. Well, they're really, really expensive. And turns out, you know, we didn't know how to do it initially. We made a ton of mistakes as, as, we, were, as we were going down this path. Um, and then you've got sort of your core business of like people internally, they're like, well, I didn't think this was really a great idea. And now that I see how much those guys are getting paid and it's failing, it's a really bad idea. And then <laughs> sure. you get sort of like internally within the company, like factions forming, uh, just human nature that change is difficult and new is scary. And then changing the way, um, I'll just give you one example, like changing the way that we sold. Right? Super proud, we had gone out, we had a sales team, we had gone out and changed law enforcement. We'd introduced this taser thing. It was this crazy concept. And we got our customers to, to buy into it. Certainly that same sales team could go out and could sell this, you know, so as we got into cameras and, and just to, to deliver, the new part of our business is called evidence.com and Axon. It's basically we, we sell cop cameras to record what happens when cops are involved in these confrontations. And then evidence.com is like iTunes for law enforcement so that our customers don't have to get in the data center business. It's cloud hosted software uh, ecosystem to make these devices very easy to use out of the box. All right, so, um, oh, selling it. Well, it turns out that people that are really good at selling weapons really don't have in their DNA to sell software. They, to go talk, it's one thing to talk to the guy at the range who's a defensive tactics guy and fires guns. He's very different than the guy in IT. And so when they would sense our salespeople, well, they don't really necessarily know what they're talking about. Right? Just not going to be really successful. The customer's got to believe your sales team really knows what they're doing. The other thing is, like, our sales team had developed a bunch of habits that were bad habits, but because the company was so successful, you associate your behaviors with the success. So, you know, our sales team, for example, had never really, we'd never really had to qualify customers uh, or have a very rigorous or strategic sales process. I mean, selling a taser, the product itself was so convincing. It was sort of like being a drug dealer where, like, you give them a, hey, here, try a sample of this. Oh. You're hooked, right? Great, <laughs> done. Well, almost the same thing. Like, hey, let's give cop here, try these tasers, take them out in the field. And it had such a dramatic impact on their lives where cops get, you know, spit at, fought with. Like, it's a, it's a tough job. And what they found is, man, I carry this taser thing and people listen to me more. <laughs> and when I've got some huge drunk guy who wants to fight, like, I don't have to go in and fight this guy and put my, you know, put my life on the line. Uh, we had great stories from cops telling me, you know, I didn't have to kill somebody today because of your device. And that word spread. And we saw a ton of success. But now as we tried to pivot, turns out convincing a cop to wear a camera, huh, well, I'm not sure it's a great idea. I don't know <laughs> if I want to do that. Right. And then convincing IT, hey, why don't you move your data to the cloud? Well, no, 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 I'm a police department. You're a private company. I can't have you with my data. Like, and so getting our sales team to, number one, they had to drink the Kool-Aid and they weren't really sure about it. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure this is a great idea anyways. Now you're asking me to go out and sell it. That's tricky. And then we had to get them to, you know, all right, we want you to ask customers a bunch of uncomfortable questions. Well, I've never had to do that before. Yeah. Like, I'm going to feel like a blue suede shoe salesman. That's, that's bad for our brand. We, you know, we're about being partners with the customer and supporting them, not like trying to sell them stuff. And so just in that one area, we had to literally hire a whole new sales team. A lot of our salespeople didn't make it. We had to bifurcate into two different sales groups and just sort of acknowledge that, you know, we got to keep the lights on and the guys who sell the weapons are really good at that. And that's a different skill set than talking to IT guys. Uh, and there were probably 50 of these that we went through as we had to sort of transform the company to ultimately be able to do uh, what we're doing today. So now that we're there, we're sort of in the promised land where, you know, that business is scaling. It's growing at over 300% year over year in sales bookings. And we've got President Obama calling for body cameras. And police chiefs can't wait to get out of the data center business, it turns out. They realize that they're not really good at it. So uh, we feel really good about where we're at today. But the process of getting here uh, was way harder than I ever thought it would be. Wow. That's, that's a crazy journey. That's pretty cool. Um, so what do you think today your team would say if someone asked them what type of a CEO you are? 
Uh, hopefully, they would say that I listen more <laughs> and that I give people room to do their jobs. Uh, you know, I, I still think I've got a, a lot of room to grow, uh, for sure. sure. Uh, I still have a tendency to want to jump in and solve uh, every problem because uh, I find them, that to me is the most rewarding part of the job is, right. here's this big, hairy, intractable problem. Let me work on it and see what I can do. And, and still stepping back, uh, it's, it's hard for me. Um, well, what advice do you have for young founders, I guess we'll say, and, and young being young in business, I'll say, in their company, um, who are kind of trying to decide if that CEO role is right for them or if they should partner with someone for that? I mean, how do you kind of evaluate if it's, if it's your thing to be that person? Tough question. Um, early on, unless you know somebody who's really going to be better at it than you know, than you would think. You know, the whole point of sort of being a founder entrepreneur is early on you got to do it. Um, I would say uh, one of the things that I think has made me a better CEO was when I had the realization that to me it will be a wonderful day when I'm not a CEO. I, I had this sort of epiphany around 07 where it was. I was getting really burned out sure. and I was micromanaging the company and not getting great feedback. And so actually at that point, I talked to my board at one point and said, Hey, you know, I want to start planning for the day. I'm not CEO. Uh, and, uh, actually looking at the organization realized, wow, I haven't built really the bench strength to be able to do that. And at this stark realization that, you know, I could be stuck here for the rest of my life, uh, <laughs> because I haven't built an organization that can run without me. So I basically started in 2007, 2008, uh, really shifted my focus instead of that I need to be the guy. It's like, okay, no, I don't. I need to like make it so the place can run without me. And the interesting thing that's happened is it's really liberating because you stop worrying about keeping your job. And it actually really also is empowering, like with my board of directors, like they know, I'm like, hey guys, the day I'm not the guy and there's somebody better, great. Like I'm all about it. Let's put let's put that guy in, and I'm going to spend more time with my kids, and I'll still support the company, you know, all I can. But that shift in mindset, I think, actually made me much more effective because it got me focused less internally and more on, uh, you know, okay, what do I need to do to get the right people so that every part of the business just runs without causing me stress and worry because I know, oh, that, I've got faith that that person can handle it. But ultimately, that's the whole point of building a great business is that's what you have to do to be a good CEO is to get those people in there. And if you get that one thing right, like I far more enjoy being CEO now than I did in 2007 when I was solving all the problems I wanted to solve, but they were driving me nuts at night because I had more of them than I could ever get to and the business couldn't scale. Yeah. Now it's actually a real pleasure because I can, I can actually relax a little bit more. Every time the phone rings and there's a crisis, which we get a lot of at Taser, <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey, I don't need to get in the middle of it. Like, you know, Steve Tuttle, who runs our PR team, will deal with this crisis, or if it's a manufacturing crisis, we have. Uh, so early on, I would say, just don't get overly focused on trying to hold on to it for yourself, because I, I think that sets you up to ultimately be a lot less effective uh, and to do the wrong things for the business, because you think you need to like protect your turf. I think there's something very empowering, in it, and it actually, I think, exudes a confidence, too, when you're like, hey, I want to do what's right for the company, and ultimately, if that means, you know, I've got to you know, step into a different role, um, it's true. Know, then, then so be it. And that will, I think, get you in the right mind frame. That, uh, the other thing is really, really, really pay attention to everybody you hire when you're a small company. Um, make sure that they're people you enjoy working with. And we really try to look for people that can operate autonomously at every level of the organization. Uh, that they that they can problem solve on their own uh, and not require a lot of oversight. Uh, so one of the things that happened to us early was because we maybe didn't hire for people that operated autonomously. Then as the business grows, there's just sort of this natural thing that happens where you know the people that were individual contributors expect to rise up in the organization, and you know, there's some fairness to that too. Uh, but we had a lot of people that rose up into management positions that were not the right people to be management. And then we ended up with a company that's like, oh, you know, it's part of the problem I've been talking about here all along. That right. Now we need to go in and change a bunch of those people out. So uh, think of those early personnel decisions. You're like planting a seed. And every one of those you want to make sure you know, yeah. is, is going to grow. And the other thing is 
if people are not a fit, get them out fast. Like, hire slow, fire fast, you know, for sure. Like, I have never in my career, when I have fired someone, I have, I've, and I've looked at it like afterwards, I've never had a time where I said, oh, I should have waited longer. Every single time, like, I knew six months ago, or I knew a year ago, and I should have just done it then. So one, once you come to a determination, it's not a fit. Like just move and get them out and get somebody else in. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So and and you guys do have a very particular like way that you look at hiring now, and you've created a culture that is what you want it to be, and and that's really admirable to have become that aware of it and be able to to do that. And Taser's hiring, right? So we are, I mean, and we only hire badasses. <laughs> very that's good. Our, we, we chose the term intentionally. We want it to be slight, slightly socially awkward and get your attention. That you know, we're serious. We only want to hire people that are badass. A badass is someone that can operate autonomously. Somebody that is awesome at their job. Who uh, and the other thing is, I would say, um, we really focus on badasses are people that want to have other badasses around them. They want people sure. working for them that are better than they are. Because I think the number one risk to an organization stagnating is having managers that won't hire people that will be threatened by the people they hire. That is like a recipe for mediocrity. You've got to be comfortable hiring people that, uh, that are going to push you. And there was a point where, there, so there was a transition point for Taser where uh, we shifted into a very different hiring model. And you can imagine, again, the organization reacted very, you know, we had a bunch of people, frankly, in management positions and their number one sort of reaction was, what does this mean for me? And sort of there was a lot of pushback to hiring people that were, uh, you know, had, we started hiring at some of the top tier schools like Harvard and Stanford, basically the same way we've seen some great tech companies have found, you know, as a small company, sometimes if someone else can do the filtering and you know, hey, they got into these great schools, they've, they've already been filtered, sure, they're pretty smart, sure. we can just focus on finding good people that we want to work with. Um, that was a big culture change when we launched what was called our leadership development program where we started recruiting at these schools just to get, and originally it was just to get bench strength. It was like, we just want to get people in that we know are going to be pretty smart and we have no idea what we're going to use them for. We'll just rotate them around to different odd jobs. Turns out that was a great recruiting tool because kids coming out of school thought this was great to get exposure to different parts of a business. Yeah. It gave us a chance to see what these people are good at and it gave us a bullpen of talent because especially once you're growing, there's always things that need to get done. And you either have to go outside and hire an unknown or, oh, hey, yeah, or maybe you wouldn't even do it if you had to go hire someone on the outside. But, hey, we've got some extra talent laying around. Let's put this person on that. Cool. Let's put this person over there. So, uh, like, my, some of our current leaders, our head of engineering, our head of sales, both came up through this leadership development program. So, they're, you know, in the early part of their career, uh, really capable individuals. And then that also cascaded into other parts of the business. So, obviously, that's not everybody great that we hire. We hire lots of folks where we're picking out of other organizations, uh, but we try to be not passive about hiring. Whereas 15 years ago, we'd put an ad in the paper and we'd sort of, you know, hey, let's interview who comes in and let's pick the best of what shows up. Whereas now, like, w you know, we're very much like, uh, uh, like we're hiring for a supply chain position right now. And, you know, we were out plucking it, uh, you know, interviewing with folks at Apple and, uh, you know, Danaher, which is a company that's really known for operational excellence. So we'll, we, we've gotten much more strategic about our hiring. But Very cool. th when you first do that and you've got this organization that's kind of a family business where everybody knows each other and is comfortable, it makes people really uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, that well, what does this mean for me? We're hiring this you know, much more aggressive people than we used to. Right, right, yeah. Well, very good. I mean, it, uh, you've you've really taken the company too, like you said, a really a really nice space now, and and everything has come together. And so, now looking back, knowing what you know now, um, is there any one or two things that you would do differently if you if you knew now, then what you know now? I, know uh, I would have put some money at, in Google at the IPO. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the number one thing would have been hiring. Yeah. that everybody says people are the most important thing. And it becomes like this platitude where it's like, yeah, people are the most important thing. And <laughs> you just, but what does that mean? Like, right. How do you get serious about that to where, well, that if people are the most important thing, then that means that it's got to move beyond like, hey, I love everybody and you know, everybody has a chance to be great. No, 
If people, you got to get badass. You got to like find the few people, the top two percent at, at everything, and to do that, you've got to. There's got to be a certain level of ruthlessness of how you approach finding and screening people. Yeah. Um, so it, it doesn't just become a sort of fuzzy HR function approach. And even to this day, I think we still. Uh, it's easy to slide back in. There's so many problems to solve um, in the business that hiring is like this extra pain in the butt. Right? It's like, uh, you know, I've got to go fill this seat. I just want to get it done. Uh, so we actually sort of recently started a program that's modeled a little bit after uh, something we picked up from Amazon. So Amazon has their bar raisers. So in their interview process, they have somebody who sits on every interview team who their job is not affected by the hire. So they don't care if this person gets hired or not. They don't feel that sense of urgency. And that person's job is to raise the bar and to make sure they're holding everybody else accountable. Like, are we hiring this person just because we're tired of interviewing or is this person really going to be awesome? Uh, so at Taser, we call it our BOW program. Uh, BOW is for badass officer. So their job is to make sure this person's a badass. Uh, and interestingly, BOW also means treasure in Chinese. So they're like treasure Aww. hunters as well. That's a good one. I like um, it. We just started that in the last three months to really sort of systematize hiring. So I, my number one thing would be hiring is not sexy. It is not glamorous. Uh, it is something that's really easy to be bad at and think you're doing a good job. And it's, it's not as intellectually interesting, at least not initially, as doing the problem solving in the business. But I would say find a way to make it interesting. Like between doing LinkedIn searches and finding ways to like, go out and be strategic about who you're going to get. Make it an interesting and strategic process so you, because it, it will have more impact than anything else you do. And uh, I learned the hard way, yeah. you know, by getting it wrong first. That's great advice. So where do you see yourself in 10 years? Oh, where do I see myself in 10 years? Um, having a team at the company that can run awesome without me there. Uh, Although I think I'll still be around because I love the business. I love being involved in it. Uh, I would say you'll probably see my role 10 years from now uh, being a little less day-to-day -day operational and more uh, strategic, which I guess is what a CEO is supposed to be anyways. Although I still have the <laughs> sense of like Catholic guilt that if I'm not, not in like, you know, <laughs> grinding away at it, that, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, um, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll still be. They'll be rocking it, huh? They'll be rocking it. Very good. All right. Is there anything else that comes to mind before we move on to our fun little game called 21 Questions? Uh, anything else that I would do differently? Oh, no. Just anything else that you'd like to share with our entrepreneurs? Yeah, I, I would just say the one thing is um, if, if you're going to be an entrepreneur or you're going to start something, start th something that you would love if it failed. Like for me, that five years into it, that like five, six years in, in that dark phase, what kept us going was all number one, guilt, because I bankrupted my parents, so I didn't <laughs> have a choice. But the other thing is like, I was really passionate about what we're doing. Um, and if it's, I think most businesses are gonna fail, fail, fail before they succeed. And, and, but, and sometimes they don't succeed at all. So I think pick something you're passionate enough about where even if it fails and you ultimately walk away, you wanna look back at the wreckage and go, man, that was a great ride. We gave it a shot, and I enjoyed that. And like many things in life, you know, make sure you enjoy the journey, um, because I, I've had a chance to see, you know, the really dark days, and we've had some really successful days. Um, and ultimately, like even like the financial success, yeah, it's cool. You know, had a Lamborghini one point, <laughs> I'm driving around, and about a week afterwards, you're driving, and people are looking at you, and you're like, why are they looking at me? Oh yeah, yeah I'm driving a Lamborghini. <laughs> this is cool. Like. <laughs> You just adjust your world like that stuff just doesn't matter. So the moment you make it, it matters. Like there's the there there's that lottery feeling. Like okay, woo, we made it. A week later, like if your house is bigger, your car is nicer, or whatever. You you totally adjust. Is a is like an organism. You adjust to the environment around you, and you're sort of right back into like your sort of your normal mental state. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think it's much more important the relationships of the people you have around you, and the the story that you're building I, I think you know your life is is your story and so make it a good one make sure that the journey you're doing is something you care about and that regardless of whether you have financial success or not because if you fail you still want to have enjoyed it and if you make a lot of money i'll tell you that alone 
doesn't really count for much. There's all these studies that show that up to about $70,000 a year in happiness, yeah, people, or $7,000 a year in, in salary, like up to that level, people get happier because guess what? You know, more money means, you know, more food for your kids and things that sort of matter. Once you get above like 70,000 a year, there's apparently no correlation between money and happiness. And I believe that 100%. So make sure that you're not doing it thinking purely it's the money, because right. I think that will also lead you to make bad decisions and do things that uh, aren't pure. Right. Whereas, you know, you hear some of these great entrepreneurs like George Merck or uh, you know, Steve Jobs who always talked about great products that you're passionate about will create value and the money comes with it. That's so. really good advice. Really good. All right, my friend. So we are going to play a little game to get to know you personally a little bit, okay? So this is called 21 Questions and just quick answers, whatever comes to mind. First one, jeans or slacks? Uh, jeans for sure. Wine or beer? Uh, mixed drinks, but I'd go with wine over beer. All right. Coke or Pepsi? Uh, Coke. Coke. Uh, mornings or nights? Nights. Favorite book? Uh, it changes a lot. Right now it would be Creativity Inc. Oh. It's a Pixar story. I really enjoyed that. Favorite web browser? Chrome. Favorite vacation spot? Uh, is no longer in existence. It was a place called the uh, Kona Village yeah, in, in Hawaii. And what we loved about that was it actually, uh, they had these little Tahitian huts. And no TV, no phone in the room, no electronics allowed anywhere on premise other than the business center. So if you wanted to work, you had to like go off like a leper wow. to this colony of people with laptops <laughs> in the business center. Uh, and what was great about it is you'd go there for a week and you would literally unplug and actually connect with your family and sit at the pond and fish with a stick with a string with your kids and Aww. like feed fish to the birds and just like really really unplug unfortunately it got hit by a tsunami and uh wiped out so it's not there anymore. Aww. favorite sport to watch uh basketball favorite sport to play uh skiing that counts favorite food Favorite food would be chips and very hot salsa. Hmm. Favorite movie or TV show? Uh, so there's two here. They're very different. Uh, one would be, so actually my favorite movie is Moulin Rouge, which is like this crazy. Did not like, see that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, sort of the crazy flair of it all. Uh -huh. is, 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 I like. Uh, and then the other is The Matrix, of course. That's the predictable Oh, okay. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matrix They're Reloaded. both good, Number though. They're both good. I like it. How about a musician you love? Uh, Don't say Britney Spears, because this would just no go Britney too Spears. far. No, Britney Spears. That I would say Cascade. Hmm. What's your go-to karaoke song? Oh, uh, that would probably be uh, Jailhouse Rock. <laughs> Elvis. That's awesome. If the speed limit is 70, how fast do you typically drive? 75. I'm not, I'm not a big speeder. My bigger problem is I'm always doing something in my head besides driving, sure. uh, which makes me kind of dangerous. So I'm really looking forward to self-driving cars. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Anything you collect? Uh, memories. I'm a big uh, sort of scrapbooker, digital scrapbooker, take tons of pictures. Every year I put together a you know, photo album with the kids, and then I, do, I edit down all of our video to music. Uh, at least it's a goal. I get really stressed out because I'm like five years behind. <laughs> that so happens. So home, home movie editing. <laughs> cool. Any phobias? Regrets. I'm a re regretophobe. Sure. I do not want to end life uh, with regrets. What is the best compliment someone can give you? That I'm a good dad. What profession other than your, your own would you like to attempt? A movie producer. What's a cause you're passionate about? Cause that I'm passionate about. Um, we started a thing called the Taser Foundation for cops that are killed in the line of duty. Uh, and then we ended up actually merging it into a larger organization. So uh, I'm pretty passionate. The police have a really uh, difficult job. Uh, again, it's one of these things that everybody says, but if you actually go out with a cop and you see what they deal with, they deal with the people every day that you and I don't want to deal with. Um, and they get treated with just tremendous disrespect constantly. Uh, and then some of them make the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, so I'm very passionate about the family, you know, making sure that those families are you know, supported. That's cool. 
one thing on your bucket list? Uh, one thing on my bucket list is living abroad with my family while my kids are still young. Uh, and speaking of which, it, so in a battle of the wills between Rick Smith and five-year-old twins, who wins? Usually Rick Smith. <laughs> that's probably uh, good. Uh-oh, no, wife's the, the coughing. Battle, the battle with the wife, I don't win. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, and then uh, last but not least, how does a taser work? How does a taser work? How does a taser work? Um, well, funny you should ask, I happen to have one. Do you? So... <laughs> Uh, so this is a Model X2. Uh, this is actually what came, I told you about the X3 that mm -hmm. failed. Uh, so this is the slimmed down version. Basically, if you made this 50% thicker, you would just about have an X3. Oh. Uh, so uh, basically, it's a handheld nerve stimulator. Now, we shape it like a gun for two reasons. Uh, one is so that police officers know how to use, so under stress, it's very intuitive to use. So they fire guns a lot. Uh, but the real sort of driver early on that we shaped it like a gun was was more psychological. Uh, so when we first were designing our taser to go into law enforcement, we made a bunch of different foam shapes, you know, like fake products that just made out of foam. And we went to a, a police show, and what we intended to do was we handed these foam models to people, and they had little lasers in them, and we had them pointed at a target. And we were intending to see what, what would be the most intuitive shape that they could aim easily. But what we learned was totally different. So that was the point of the experiment. But what happened was when cops came up and they would come up to the table, they'd look at all the different foam shapes and they'd be like, yeah, 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 ooh. And they'd pick up the one looked like, yeah, <laughs> that's a weapon. And we saw, it, we're like, dude, it's a piece of foam. <laughs> but the fact we shaped it like a gun conveyed this sense of seriousness so I originally wanted to shape our first law enforcement taser like a Star Trek, you know, sort of super futuristic thing. And the <laughs> cops all laughed at the one that looked futuristic on the table. So we literally selected the gun shape. Now, they also, it turns out they were more accurate with it because, so it did fulfill that as well. But Makes it was sense. just really interesting that the psychological reaction was so different. Yeah. Anyway, so it's a gun shaped device, but uh, it's an electrical nerve stimulator. So when I activate the safety here, uh, I can actually warn somebody, sir, stop what you're doing. They're going to get hit with 50,000 volts, so I can show them a little arc that turns out we get like a 90% surrender rate uh, if you just show them that. I uh, can see that. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, uh, you would basically just put your laser dots on your target, and if you press the trigger, it'll fire out two darts. Woo. Shut it off. Uh, basically, we've got small jumper cables, and these are uh, conducting electricity from the power supply in the device to our remote target. Uh, that electric signal is calibrated very precisely to go after your alpha motor neurons. Uh, these are the nerve cells that cause your muscles to move. So my brain right now is communicating tons of information out to my body. You know, just even to, for me to stand up requires quite a bit of effort. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is we plug into the communication system of the body and we take over. So when you see somebody with a taser, it looks like a seizure. What's happening is we're overstimulating the muscles. So you'll see the musculature go rigid and they fall over uh, because it turns out um, relaxation, if we have any like yoga or meditation folks, right? Relaxation is the absence of stimulation. Hmm. You cannot tell your body to relax. You just tell it, okay, don't be active. Interesting. So when we plug in a taser, there's no countermeasure. Your brain can't say, okay, stop doing that or you know, relax because the stimulation that we're sending in is just like, and that's actually what makes the taser such a wonderful technology for a weapon, is we take out command and control without causing physical damage. Now again, sometimes people get hurt, they can, there can be injuries and falls, et cetera, but under a typical use scenario, we plug it in, we basically tell your muscles to contract using the same sort of patterns that your brain does, uh, only a little, strong, a little more powerful, <laughs> um, but when we shut it off, like we didn't actually damage the wiring of the body. Uh, it's all still intact. We've just temporarily taken it over. Well, that curtain still looks like it's doing okay. So, right, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, all right, you guys. So we have a few minutes for Q&A. So um, I think, let's see, it looks like Kristen has a mic. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and she will come along. Go ahead and stand up, state your name, and then ask your question. Um, Spencer Thomason, we were talking before. So how do you guys do uh, product safety testing? I mean, do you really line people up and just zap them? Ah. I mean, wait. <laughs> so um, really good question. Um, 
And it changes over time. Like when you're a small startup, you gotta be really scrappy. The first test that developed the M26 cost us $2,500. Uh, so we found a researcher that, from the University of Nebraska who, as happenstance had it, also had grown up on a family farm. And he was the most published guy in the stun gun space. And so we originally, when we, when we figured out the tasers weren't working really well, item number one was, okay, we, we got to go, like, there's no published literature on how do you paralyze somebody. Right? <laughs> like, nobody had ever done the work. Go figure. And so we said, okay, well, we're going to build, we'll, we'll just, all right, let's solve this problem. We'll build a super taser. So we built this benchtop device where you could add more batteries, more power, and we could vary, there's about three or four different characteristics. So, okay, we could vary each of these characteristics. And we hired this researcher who said, look, we want you to take a pig, anesthetize it so it's not going to feel any pain, because pain is easy to cause. And pain, we could, you know, actually, <laughs> In the early days, we did some pain tests where we did like the Pepsi challenge. We, we, get sh we found that was not a good way to develop product. <laughs> and it, it got old really quick, shocking each other to try and figure out which would be more effective. <laughs> so then we went to this animal testing model. And so we, we had the pig anesthetized so it didn't feel any pain. And we hooked it up and we basically started throwing switches. And very quickly, it was, okay, got it. We see the things that we have to do to, to make this thing really effective. Uh, then before we went to market, so we had that same researcher then go do a literature search. And it turns out, luckily, that electricity in general from a safety perspective is pretty well understood. Uh, so he's able to show, look, we, we fall within relevant safety standards by a significant margin. And then we did go and we hired, uh, we went to the University of Missouri to do cardiac safety studies in their lab, actually using test animals where they were intentionally like doing things to exacerbate cardiac risks to make sure that we still didn't have an issue. Uh, then we went into human trials, uh, and then we launched the product. Now, the early one, again, was much less than we do today. So today, being a bigger company with more resources, uh, we have a medical advisory board. So on the board of our directors, we have uh, the former Surgeon General. On our medical advisory board, we have the most recent president of the American Heart Rhythm Society, the former chief technology officer of one of the world's largest pacemaker companies. So as we've gotten a little bigger, we could put more resources on it. Um, and we, we follow a bit of a similar paradigm to a medical device company, only we're not a medical device, so we don't, it's, our testing is much less bureaucratic, frankly, than you would have to do to get through the FDA as a medical device. But, you know, compared to weapons companies, you know, I, I think we do really good, uh, really good research. It all, it all starts with animal research, comparative computer models, then once you sort of refine what you're doing. And now when we, before we go to market, we, we do human studies where we have instrumented subjects, so people that are under medical supervision, and we're monitoring, like using ultrasound, to actually watch the heartbeat while they're getting shocked with the electrodes in sort of the worst case positions, so that we can actually, you know, that's the big thing you worry about with electricity is cardiac effects. And then ultimately, I end up getting hit with them all before they go to market. Because <laughs> uh, I can sit here and tell you all day it's safe, or I can show you a video of me taking a hit. And, you know, it's pretty it's convincing. It's more effective, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So if you do start a non-lethal weapons company, just be prepared. You're going to have to, you're going to have to do it. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Max Lepachowski. I'm a senior in high school. Don't have a company just yet. Um, so did you, um, was it your company who designed the um, shotgun taser? Yep. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Um, is that technology going to get any more compact anytime soon? Like maybe even down to a handgun size round? Uh, so great question. Actually, the shotgun round taser was my original idea for the business. That I went to see Jack Cover, the, the inventor of the taser, to ask him, hey, here's a couple technical assumptions that I think we could, if this is right, we could put it in a shotgun. And I remember him saying, well, huh, that's interesting. I have no idea if it'll work or not, because the questions you're asking, nobody's ever done the research to really vet it. But hey, I, why don't we do this other thing? I've got this air-powered taser. So I basically put that on the shelf, and we went and we did the air-powered taser approach. Uh, 10 years later, we got around to testing. It turns out the shotgun idea did work. And that was probably our greatest technical achievement. But as a product, it was a commercial failure. Uh, when we launched the shotgun round into the marketplace, they cost us around 150 bucks a piece uh, was the market price. And what we learned was our customers were actually getting angry at us. They're like, 150 bucks a round? 
like, you guys are ripping us off. I'm like, no, dude, it's like a flying aerial vehicle with a taser <laughs> built in. Like, this stuff doesn't come cheap. Uh, and then in the field, it was actually somewhat unreliable uh, compared to our regular taser devices. Just a lot of things had to go right. So it worked great in the lab. But whereas our regular tasers are about 80 to 95% effective in the field, this one was about 65% effective. So what was happening now is our customers were like, not only did you sell me this expensive thing, but the damn thing didn't work. And our salespeople were like having fights with customers over Aww. this. And then we had to look at it and we realized, well, wait a minute. These devices, these little shotgun rounds are only going to get used in like the most super dangerous situations. And we already get sued plenty. So like for every one of these, we're like sticking our neck out for a super high risk lawsuit. And customers weren't loving it. And it was only really being used by specialty police units. So it was a relatively small market. And the amount of engineering time it was consuming was extraordinary. So one of the most painful decisions I ever made was to kill it. Basically say, I know this was my baby and super proud of it, but it's not working as a business. And uh, what was the problem? What's that? What was the problem? With the oh, well, well uh, it, the, the core problem with the product in terms of reliability was in order for it to fit in a shotgun shell, we had to be able to get skin contact. So this taser uh, here, uh, one of the reasons that this works really well is because we have this high voltage, it can actually jump like you see the electrical arc jump across the front of the cartridge here. That, if we just get the darts close to your body, electricity will jump in. On the taser projectile, we can't fit enough battery juice to make a long spark. So it had to touch your skin. Well, it turns out that trying to get two, uh, and we have to separate the two electrodes. So if I have two darts, like two points close together, this is gonna hurt right here, but it's not getting past at me. So we actually have to get a second connection some distance away, so the electricity transverses a bunch of nerve fibers. Uh, turns out getting it to do that reliably was really hard, so that's why it had a sort of less effectiveness. We will get back to it at, at, uh, you know, at some point in the future. I think we'll see uh, the wireless technology come back, but uh, it's probably not in the next five or so years. We have, uh, uh, it's just, it's, it's more of a lab technology than a field technology at this point. You know what the first reference was for um, stun rifles? Jules Verne. Yeah, yep, and uh, yeah, awesome. yeah. And, and actually there was, so the, do you know where the name Taser came from? Uh, no, I don't. So, uh, of course, I have a home field advantage on this one. <laughs> uh, 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 it actually came from Tom Swift's electric rifle. So there was, a, uh, there was another science fiction uh, writer, uh, I think it was Appleton was his name, Anyway, who, who wrote these books about Tom Swift, this fictional character, and Jack Cover, who invented the taser, grew up reading the Tom Swift series in the 1930s, and there was a book called Tom Swift and His Electric Rifle that also had, uh, you know, a uh, this sort of, this was the science fiction of 100 years ago. Right. And uh, so that's where the name taser came from. Huh. Uh, one more question, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. Um, have you noticed, like, any particular patterns with, like, um people with what sort of specialty degrees get um, recognized the most in the startup world? Like uh, someone who has an MD or a PhD in theoretical physics or something like that. People get recognized the most in terms of like, um, oh, this guy's actually pretty smart, that kind of thing. No. There, there might be some of that, but like, uh, if you're interested in being an entrepreneur, don't waste your time going for a PhD. It, you know, the extra five, six, seven years. In my opinion, again, I hope I don't offend anybody here and your parents are probably like, don't listen to this guy, he's an idiot. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know that that makes a huge difference uh, in sort of the tech world. I would say, uh, you sh you, what I tell everybody and I tell my own kids, get a technical degree. Uh, like it's, gr you know, it's great if you're interested in like Greek literature. You know. <laughs> if you're interested in particularly being an entrepreneur, Sure, study some Greek literature, be happy, whatever. Study computer science uh, and get a hard skill uh, in school. Even if you're not really interested in doing engineering work, like learning like engineering concepts and having a technical degree will make you much more effective. I mean, uh, actually my kids that are five and 11 now, uh, if, I, if they'll listen to me when they get to college, I would tell them study neurobiology and computer science, joint degree. That's what I would do as an undergrad, because the coming, the, I think the human machine interface is getting more and more intimate. Singularity. Uh, I think that's where, I think that's where the, the next 20 years are going to be really interesting. So. One more question.
So I'm just kind of wondering, first of all, have your tasers been in movies? And if they have, um, how does it affect sales? And then also, how did like the tase, don't tase me, bro, video affect sales? I know you so did a lot. I'm sorry, someone had to ask. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Of course, we've been, we've been in a ton of movies. Uh, the Hangover, somebody brought that one up earlier. So there's a plus and a minus to it. Uh, the plus is, of course, like everybody knows our brand. The minus is, oh, yeah, <laughs> taser. <laughs> ah, you know, okay. You know, I hear that every day of my life. Um, you know, it's, and yeah, yeah, I have to have a sense of humor about it, but sometimes the brand does get caught up in sort of the, the ham fisted, like Hollywood uh, comedy uses of it. Um, uh, so, in general, though, you know, great. We, we love the exposure and it, we've become part of pop culture uh, to some degree. Like, you know, I've got young kids, so I, you know, I'm watching Mr. Peabody and Sherman, like a cartoon with a little dog. And, Somebody gets tased in the movie, or the Smurf movie. Somebody gets tased. Despicable Me, lipstick taser, right? I mean, it's actually pretty cool. But yeah, kids go be. bonkers when yeah. they, it's cool. in their movies. Uh, so don't tase me, bro. This is a really interesting one. So put your, you know, back in time. We're just coming out of the SEC investigation. We've been getting the, our butt sued off. There's like all this negative media storm on like how deadly tasers are, and then the don't tase me, bro thing happens, and we're braced. We're like, oh my god, this is going to be awful. <laughs> And then we're watching the news and people are like, yeah, the guy deserved it. He like wanted, you know, he wanted to be tased. And it kind of, it, it was actually a bit lighthearted. Uh, not that, you know, not that you should necessarily be lighthearted about tasing people, but he was fine. Uh, and it was just, it just went in a very different way. It was, it was actually kind of nice that it just changed the conversation. So people were talking about taser in a different way than, you know, when, when, when a taser is used and somebody dies, like, you know, it's tragic. I mean, it's, it's an awful, awful thing. And uh, to have so much of the, you know, so much of the conversation was around the, the negative outcomes. When we've tracked, you know, statistically, we can say there's probably over 100,000 people who have not been seriously injured or killed because police had our weapons. Well, you can't really quantify, you know, those, those stories aren't as compelling as the negative ones. Uh, and so the don't tase me bro thing was this interesting turning point where I think it just sort of was a sigh of like, okay, we've all had this big debate about taser safety and maybe here's a different way to look at it that's almost got a little bit of that comedic theme to it. And um, so it wasn't near as bad as we thought it was gonna be. And then, you know, the fact that Don't Taze Me Bro ended up being like, I guess, selected by the Yale Dictionary Review, whoever, you know, the most memorable phrase of the year was, was kind of <laughs> cool. It was like, you know, we were kind of proud of that. It's like, all right, we, we, we've kind of made it into pop culture. Uh, with the don't daze me bro thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's give him a hand. Thank you so much, Greg. Well done. <laughs> so, I, w I, I would want to come back. I'm feeling guilty now about talking about graduate degrees. Uh, oh. I, I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, it, it's actually not a bad place in ac to stay in academia uh, if that's your interest. My point is just if you had an idea to go pursue as an entrepreneur, I wouldn't be like, no, 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 I've got to stay in school and get through my PhD before I would go do this. Like when divine inspiration strikes, you know, go for it. And I, I just haven't personally seen that, you, know, you you're gonna have to have people around you with advanced degrees, you know, like in our case, uh, like having the Surgeon General on the board certainly helps when he talks about safety. So I wouldn't say don't go for an advanced degree, but don't view it like it's gotta be a sequential thing where you've gotta mm -hmm. do that before you could, uh, you know, jump and, and do something entrepreneurial.